we begin today, I want to share and highlight several announcements in the bulletin. Uh, we have the Resurrection Sunday coming up. We're looking forward to that and I trust that you will uh, invite guests, friends, family to come uh, for that special Sunday and that special uh, service. Also wanted to mention if you're part of the care group uh, today after the service, if you would meet downstairs briefly. Uh, there's some things to address in that particular area. And then for the uh, ambassadors, there are two events coming up in April to uh, draw to your attention. Uh, the first Friday of the month lunch uh, will be uh, the 7th, April 7th, and we're going to meet in the back here so there's no steps uh, to deal with. And it's also Good Friday, so there will be uh, scripture reading uh, concerning the death of Christ, special music as well. And then if you bring a guest who needs to know the Lord, we have a, a track just for that occasion. So on that Friday, uh, plan on coming, and the uh, dinner is listed here, uh, what we're having. And so please keep that in mind on that Friday. And then Sunday on the 16th of April, after church, there's the Ambassador's Luncheon. And that day, um, there'll be a presentation uh, of Italy that's going to focus on the Christian history of Italy. And so from noon to 1.30 uh, is that luncheon and then that presentation that we're looking forward to. And there's sign-up sheets in the foyer uh, for those, if you would... Plan on coming, sign up so we can plan accordingly. Uh, we appreciate it. And then also there um, has been inquiries from people about joining the church membership. If you have interest in becoming a member, let me know, and I'll be happy to speak with you about uh, becoming a member at Grace Baptist Church. Uh, at this time, uh, we'll have the prelude as we begin to prepare our hearts to worship Christ together. blessing in our time together. Father in heaven, we come today and we pray that you would guide and direct in this service. We pray that our hearts would be open to singing praises to you, uh, to glorify your name, and we thank you for that uh, saving grace that brings us into that position where we have a, a relationship with you, where we can know you, where the Holy Spirit of God uh, works in our lives to bring forth that praise and that thanksgiving. And Lord, I pray that we would also be open to the word of God. We pray that we would have a understanding of it as the Holy Spirit would uh, open our hearts and minds to it. 
And then, Lord, I pray that you would apply it to our our lives as we examine our hearts and make sure that we are where you would have us to be. And we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the power of it, the truth of it. We thank you for the uh, reality that it is our authority that is relevant for all of our needs, for every portion of our lives. And Lord, I pray that we would be in the word of God, desiring to follow the word of God. And we thank you for this church family here today. We thank you for those that are here. We pray that you would uh, encourage them in their faith, meet their every need according to your grace. We also pray for the many who are not able to be here today. We pray for those who are uh, ill, that you would encourage them and heal their bodies. Pray for those who are away, that you would give them uh, traveling mercies and bring them back safely. And in all things, Lord, we pray that you would uh, work in our hearts, work in our church to your glory, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
The gentle healer came into our town today. He touched blind eyes and their darkness left to stay. But more than the blindness, he took their sins away. The gentle healer came into our town today. The gentle healer came into our town today. He spoke one word that was all he had to stay. And the one who died just rose up straight away. The gentle healer came into our town today. Oh, he seems like just an ordinary man With dirty feet and rough but gentle hands But the words he says are hard to understand and yet he seems like just an ordinary man. The gentle healer, he left our town today. I just looked around and found he'd gone away. Some folks from town who followed him, they say that the gentle healer is the truth, the life, the way.
you take your Bibles this morning and turn to Exodus chapter 3, we're picking up the account of Moses. And if you recall where we left off, he had fled from Egypt. He has reached Midian, the desert area, and there he assisted a Midian priest's family, the daughters, and he's married one of the daughters. He's been functioning as a shepherd for 40 years, and we pick up the account, and probably most of you, if you've been in church for any period of time, if you've read your Bible, you're familiar with the story of the burning bush, and that's Exodus chapter 3 this morning. And as we look at the passage, let me encourage you to be thinking about application. Uh, what is it that God wants you to apply from the account of Moses hearing the voice of God from the burning bush? And I'm pretty sure you're aware and not looking for a burning bush and the voice of God. And so the challenge then becomes, well... If this happened with Moses in a time where God would speak occasionally in that way, what should we take away from it today? And I think you'll find a very good encouragement and challenge when you apply uh, the burning bush account with Moses calling, being called by God to, now's the time, Moses, to go and set my people free. And so we look, first of all, that the man of God is ready in verse 1. It says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now for 40 years, Moses has been tending the flock. And for 40 years, God has been working in the life of Moses, shaping him into the man that he needed to be, in order to fulfill God's call to set the people free from Egypt. And so for 40 years, he's been working in this desert, tending these sheep, a very lowly profession. And remember the history here. Moses was raised in Egypt. Uh, he was the, possibly the next in line to be the leader of Egypt. He had anything the world wanted to give to him. And yet he understood that he was the one that was to lead the people free and to set them from out from under Pharaoh's uh, rule. But he moved ahead of God, killed that Egyptian, and then had to run for his life. And so we pick it up here in chapter 3, and now we see here's Moses. And God's been working in his life to get him into a position where he can successfully serve God. And so we see the 40 years of training, and it's about to come to an end. And so 40 years he's raised in Egypt, 40 years now he's been trained in the desert by God as he has humbly served. And the timing of God, as we see, is always right. And as you think of Moses, here's this servant. He's now going to be ready to answer the call. And as he's tending the sheep of, of this man, that his father-in-law, we find that he records that he did so at the mountain of God, at Mount Horeb. And when you think of this mountain, what you're going to see is it comes into play later because it's going to be that mountain where Moses, who now is where he needs to be in his mindset and his trust in God rather than trusting in himself and running ahead, he's going to go up that very mountain and receive what? The Ten Commandments from God. He's going to be face to face with God. And as you think of the timing of God in Moses' life, and also think of the timing of God in your life, Moses wanted to run ahead. Good intentions? Yes. <clears throat> Waiting on the Lord? No. Seeking God's will? No. He had his own plan, his own way, and he was going to get it done. And God had to rein him in, so to speak, and bring him to the point where he would now be seeking God's will, God's timing, and God's way. 
And so now the timing is right. And as you think of your own life, as you live for Jesus Christ, and you're making decisions on a regular basis, decisions about relationships, decisions about uh, dealing with work, responsibilities in life, they should all be centered upon what is God's will so that I can respond to life's circumstances in a way that is following God's will, God's timing, and God's way, and not my own will, not my own timing, not trying to rush ahead of God and handle things my way. Let God's timing come into play as you seek his will, as you follow the word of God. And so Moses, God's work in his life, he's trained him, in a sense, on those deserts, tending those sheep. And then we're going to see now the message is sent by God to Moses. As it says in verses 2 and 3, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire, from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see the, this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And the first thing you can note here is the miraculous burning bush. As that bush takes fire, Moses, tending his sheep, takes note of it, and what does he see? Well, that bush should be consumed by now. Under normal circumstances, that bush should be gone, obliterated by fire. But instead, it continues to exist, and the fire continues to burn. And so we have a miraculous act of God to demonstrate to Moses that what he's about to hear is from the Lord. And when you think of miracles in the Bible, we always need uh, to keep in mind what God says the purpose of them is. And so as that bush is continuing to burn when it shouldn't, that is God sending a message to Moses that I'm now operating my world in a way that I normally do not. And Moses has probably seen and knew how these bushes burned. Maybe he started fires with them, and he knew it wouldn't last long. But as he sees this, God is now operating his world in a way that he normally does not. And when he did that in the Bible, when miracles were performed in that way, he was sending a message to his people, in this case to Moses, that Moses, what's occurring here right now is from God. Let there be no doubt about it that as you are going to hear God speaking, that it is truly God, no one else or nothing else, but God is going to speak to you. So we see here that the miraculous burning bush is a miracle from God. And when you think of uh, miracles today, we do not expect to see a burning bush. We do not expect to see biblical miracles occurring today because God has told us in Scripture that these forms of giving forth a message from God are no longer necessary because we have the completed Scripture, the completed canon, the Bible. And so the biblical miracles that you find in Scripture, whether it's the burning bush, the parting of the sea, the causing of the blind to see, uh, the lame walking, et cetera, et cetera. That was for those times so that the people of God understood this is God working, this is God speaking, and they needed that information until that which was perfect, the written word of God, was completed. And then miracles would diminish to the point of ceasing. And I know many times people will say today, well, does God still do miracles? Uh, the answer to that biblically is yes and no. Uh, no, he does not perform biblical miracles that we see in scripture because they're no longer necessary because we have the completed scripture, Bible. Does he do miraculous things? He may choose to do that, 
but it's not going to be based upon you or I performing some miracle. It's going to be God acting according to his sovereign will to accomplish whatever his will may be. And so you can expect God to do powerful, miraculous things as he deems fit. But it will not be through people performing miracles as we see in scripture. Which goes back to what we said at the beginning. Well, if that's the case, well, what's the application to us today? And we'll get to that, but be thinking about it. Uh, should you expect a burning bush experience? No, the Bible says you, you don't need it. You got everything you need. So what should we expect? And we'll answer that question here in a little bit. And so you have this miracle that's caught Moses' attention. You also have a uh, special messenger. It says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in the midst of that burning bush. Now, who is the angel of the Lord? Uh, this is the pre-incarnate Jesus. Uh, the way that this is written, uh, the way the language is written, is directing our understanding to this is Jesus Christ before he became a man, the second person of the Trinity. And so he's the one that's going to speak to Moses and tell Moses that he, it's time now for him to go and to release, free the people of Israel out from underneath Pharaoh. And so the language points to Christ. Uh, if you look at the appearances of Christ in the Old Testament before the incarnation, there's a few cases in the Old Testament where that happened. After he came to this earth uh, as a man, you no longer see that happening in Scripture. It's no longer happening in history. But at this point, it's Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ, the messenger of God, who is there to speak to Moses. And again, as you think of Jesus Christ uh, throughout Scripture, the Bible's all about Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, Jesus Christ is the center of the Bible. Everything connects to who he is, God's plan for what he was to do, is to do, and will do. It all centers around Jesus. And it's interesting, here you have Jesus speaking to Moses about whom? God's nation, God's people, Israel. And he's saying to Moses, now is the time that you're going to go down and bring them out of Egypt. What was God's purpose for the nation of Israel? His purpose was to bring forth the Messiah, Jesus. Not only the King of Israel, but also the Savior of, of sinners. And so Moses is being brought into God's plan for salvation, God's plan for Israel, and it's Jesus Christ himself who's going to call him to serve. And so we have this miraculous burning bush. We have the special messenger and then we see next how Moses turns to God. And you think back to his first act in Egypt when he was thinking of freeing the people. Now you come to a new point in Moses' life. His response to the call of God that now's the time, Moses, for you to go and set my people free. And what you want to do is, is to notice the change in Moses. Notice what God has done in Moses' life. He responded the first time in his own strength, in his own wisdom. He wanted to accomplish something. Good, good idea, good intentions, but he wasn't where God wanted him to be. Now you're going to see the change that Moses experienced as God worked in his life as he was in the desert. And here's what I would encourage you to do. Notice with me the change, but then also look to apply it to your own life and service for Christ today. And I think this is where the application in the scripture speaks to our hearts, speaks to us today. It's a different time, the church, church age, but it's still the same God. And it's the same God who wants to use his people to serve him. 
Therefore, we need to have the right mindset and the right approach in submitting ourselves to God and saying, here I am. And so we see the need to turn to God. And the first thing it says, verse 4, so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look. Now the previous verse said that the bush caught his attention, so he turned aside to study it, to examine, now how can this be happening? It says now that God saw that he turned to look. And the idea here is that he stepped away from tending the flock. He stepped away from his responsibilities for a moment to do something else, to consider what was occurring as this bush was burning and as the angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ, is going to give him a message. So he was giving his undivided attention to Christ, to God. And he's turning away from the distractions that he normally had to deal with in life. And so God captures his attention. And when you stop and think about serving the Lord, here's what I hope you begin to put together. God has saved every single person in the church today to serve him in some capacity. Every one of us, has something that God has called us to do within his church, within his local churches, to serve his purposes for today. And what God needs us to regularly do is take those moments where we step away from the distractions of the world, from the normal routines of our lives, and we focus on God and say, what would you have us to do? You listen to God and say, where would you want me to serve? Or how do you want me to serve? Or do you want me to continue where I am? And this is God's will. Or is there something else that needs to change? And so the first thing we see with Moses is he's no longer caught up in the things that were going on around him, but he's now focusing on God. He turns away from his responsibilities to listen to God and examine his heart before the Lord. And then you have the turning to respond to God as verse 4 goes on. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Emphasis upon Moses, repeating his name twice. You can imagine if that was you, what would your response be? Well, number one, the bush isn't burning up. Now I'm hearing a voice of God from that voice or from that bush. He probably was shocked, maybe a little fearful, maybe very curious. Maybe there's real concern. Now here's God coming to me and calling my name. And so it's Moses, Moses. And as you think of this, in light of the burning bush, and you remember the question, well, we're not expecting a burning bush experience. God tells us not to. So how do we hear the calling of God? How do we find the will of God? Well, as you think of the burning bush, a miracle was a way that God communicated special revelation. God communicated his truth to his people. And so when a miracle was performed, God's people who observed it, they would be in awe, they would be amazed because God's operating his world in a different way. But there was also that message that was being sent to them that whatever's occurring here, whether it's a voice of God or a man of God speaking, it's of God. It's God's word for you. Today, we don't have burning bushes speaking to us. We don't have dreams, we don't have visions, we don't have voices. Why? Because the Bible tells us we have everything in the written word of God. So what is your burning bush today? It's the written word of God. We need to come to the word of God to understand, here's God's will for the church today, this is God's will for individuals today, it's how God speaks to us, to tell us this is his plan for the church and his people in the church. 
And so we come to the word of God to understand God's will. Now we have to pray, we have to think through, we should get counsel from other people, but our burning bush, so to speak, is the word of God. And God's word will tell us and direct us in the general ways that we should be serving him within the church. And so you see the uh, turning to respond as Moses, Moses is called out. And then when you look at uh, the turning away from distractions, then the turning to respond to God, now you begin to see the proper way that God's servants should respond to God's calling them to serve. For Moses, it was as an individual in relationship to the nation of Israel. This is, Moses, what you are to do. For us today, when we come to Scripture, the burning bush of Scripture tells us as the followers of Christ. It's through the church today that God is working. He's building his church and he has chosen to add to his church servants. And every single one of us have a gift, a ministry, something to contribute to the work of the church and the building of the church. And there needs to be that proper response and that proper attitude in responding to it. And we get the example here from Moses. And the first thing we see is the willingness to submit. It says, and he said, here I am. Basically, what it's saying, Moses hears God's voice, and he says, I'm here. I'm here, I'm ready, I'm open, I'm submitted to what you want me to hear and how you want me to respond. And there's the willingness to submit to God versus what he did before, which was what? I'll do an end run around God, I'll do it my way, I'll do it in my strength, and I'll figure things out as we go. Now we see God has brought him to a point where it says, Moses, Moses. And his first response was, here I am. Whatever you want from me, I'm here. And so as you think of the service of the Lord today in the church, every single one of us should have that mindset. Lord, here I am. Whatever you want from me, I'm in. Whatever you want to show me to do, whatever you want me to accomplish by your grace within the work of the church, I'm willing and I've submitted to it. And that's, again, that's something that's for every believer. Now, often we take that and we apply it to the call to the pastorate and the mission field. And certainly that's wonderful application here. But when you look at the scripture, what does the scripture say? It says every single believer is a part of the body and has to contribute something. It can be small or great in the evaluation of men, but in the plan of God, it's all equal. Whatever God has called that person to do. And so the first response to that truth should be every one of us should be saying, I'm here, Lord, whatever you want, I'm all in. Now, where do we go from there? And we notice the next thing is the recognition of holiness. A fascinating picture here with a wonderful application. He says, then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. You look here and you say, what is this all about? Why would God make this point? Why would he say, Moses, take off your sandals because you're standing on holy ground. And you notice what is holy. It's not the bush. It's the ground in which the bush was speaking, but where Moses was standing. And you say, well, what's the purpose of that? What's the point being made to Moses? Well, the point is this, it's Moses, what I'm about to say to you is special, it's unique, it's important, it's I have separated you from the world, from everything else, to serve me. And to get that message through to Moses, he needed to 
give him that picture, take off your sandals, and in a sense, draw a circle, Moses, around the bush, you and me. And guess what? What I'm about to call you to do is unique, it's special, but it's my will for your life. I've separated you from the things that you're doing, from the world, from your ideas, everything else. I've separated you to do this task. And so it's a holy ground situation. And you might say, well, what's the application to us? Well, keep thinking through the process. The Bible tells you God has saved you. You have eternal hope. You're going to be with God in heaven. But it also tells you in the meantime, God has saved you, separated you from what? The world separated you from serving yourself and separated you unto Jesus Christ to serve him in the church today. And that's a wonderful truth, but a very clear truth that this is what God has done. And if you look at 1 Peter, if you turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1, remember Peter is writing to encourage these believers under persecution. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, he reminds them of what God has done in saving them and making them holy. He says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct, because it is written, be holy for I am holy. In a sense, God has put a circle around you and said... I've saved you, separated you from your sin, separated you from the world, saved you from your life of serving the flesh, and now I've made you holy. I've saved you to myself. And the purpose of that is to be a testimony to glorify God, but also to serve God. If you keep looking in 1 Peter at chapter 4 and verse 10, As he's getting to the end of the letter, chapter 4, verse 10, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Look, look at the picture. Manifold grace, all types of grace. He saved you, called you to be holy, separated you to himself, and he's saying you are there to serve him. He's got a gift, a ministry for you to perform with others in the church. Verse 11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. So this is the picture God's putting before you. Uh, he has saved you, he's made you holy, separated you to himself to serve him. And that's a wonderful privilege. And we don't need a burning bush to tell us that, because we have the word of God that calls all believers to constantly be thinking, what is it that God wants me to do? How can I serve him? How can I keep serving him? Uh, this is what God has called us to do. So the recognition of holiness simply means to step back and realize, yeah, God saved me, and he separated me to himself, and he separated me to serve him in his plan for the day, which is the church. And then you uh, notice as the response of Moses continues, the acknowledgement of unworthiness. And again, there's something here for us to apply and to learn. Verse 6, it says, Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So here's God revealing himself, Christ speaking, uh, saying, now this is the one true God. And it says, Moses did what? He hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now that's, again, what a difference from before. As God speaks to him and says, Moses, Moses, and this is what I'm going to have you do, as he realizes this is God speaking, 
He hides his face, and he's afraid to look upon God. What is it acknowledging? I'm unworthy. There is nothing within me that can accomplish anything for God. And you might say, well, Moses is going in the wrong direction. Well, actually, he's not, because that's exactly what God had now taught him to think and to do. Moses, it's not about you. Moses, it's not about your wisdom. Moses, it's not about your power and your training. It's all about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's about the power of the one true God. And so here we see the proper response to serving God is to say, I'm unworthy, I can't do anything. And when you have that mindset, it's not meant to say, I'm not going to do it, or I can't do anything, but it's saying, yeah, I, I, I can't contribute anything to the cause of Christ, to the work of building the church. It has to be of God. Otherwise, nothing will be accomplished that matters for eternity. Same thing was true for Moses. What was Moses being called to do? He was being called to go down and face off with Pharaoh the most powerful person in the world. And he's being called to go to Pharaoh and say to Pharaoh, hey, I'm here to tell you God wants you to let his people go. And if Moses tries to do that in his own strength, what's going to happen? Well, it's game over, not going to happen. He's going to be defeated. But if he has this mindset of this is God calling me, I'm submitting to it, and I'm recognizing I can't do it, but God can, but I'll be your servant, then that's where God wants him to be. And you think about that in the church today, in our local church as an example, that, that's a wonderful mindset to have. It's an exciting mindset to have. We should all be saying, yeah, <laughs> by ourselves, in our own wisdom, if we do our own programs, if we do our own thing, we have nothing, and we can accomplish nothing. We might get people. We might have things that humanly are occurring that we might label as success, but if it's without the power of God, we have nothing. And so that should be the mindset of the local church, the pastor, the deacons, teachers, music people, every single member of the church, that should be our thinking. We can't do it, but praise God, he can. And just as he called Moses to accomplish the, the releasing of Israel out of Egypt, he's called us to do what? The Great Commission, building his church, contributing as he sees fit, as we submit to him, and we acknowledge, God, we need you to work. God, use the word of God as it goes forth to save souls. Lord, you use the word of God as it's brought forth in teaching and discipleship to grow us in the things of Christ. And if that's happening by the grace of God, that's where we want to be. So to say that we're unworthy, yes, we need to say that. But with that little attachment, but we're connecting to the power of God. We're not walking away. But we're saying, yeah, we can't do it, but our God can. Jesus Christ can. And we're relying upon him to build his church. And then you see the awareness of God's plan, verses 7 to 9. As, as the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression which which the Egyptians oppress them. So he's saying to Moses, you know, Moses, I'm aware of what's happening, and now you need to be aware of God's plan. Now's the right time. Now's the time to go. And it's not going to be Moses who picks the time or the way. 
Now Moses is saying, I'm trusting completely in God. I'll yield to whatever he would desire me to do. And so we have the application, as we just mentioned. You can apply that to the church today. It's God's plan to build his church. He lays it out in scripture. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. He's called us to preach and to teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's called us to go to all nations, to share the gospel with every single person that we can. And he's called us to make disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is what we're functioning and doing as we are aware of God's plan. And then again, keep in mind, every single believer has a part to play in that. Wonderful privilege, wonderful blessing. And again, remember, if it's a little thing, to God it's not a little thing. Uh, if you're praying, that's God's purpose, or helping in a care group, or teaching, or whatever it might be, that's God's will for your life. It's adding up for eternity, and it's contributing to Christ building his church. And this is what we need to see and be aware of God's plan for every single Christian. And then you see the personal call of God in verse 10, as it says, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now, Moses, this is what I want you to do. This is what you are being called to do. So you now get ready. You come. You present yourself to me as he is doing, submitting, yielding, saying, not my will, but your will be done. We see that personal call that's given to him. And when you think of the uh, application to you and I today, uh, there definitely is the call of God to the mission field and to the pastorate. And I would say to anybody here, if you feel God is calling you to the pastorate or the mission field, you let me know. And we'll help you seek out if that's God's will, that's God's call to your life. But it begins by looking at Moses and following that example. Here I am, Lord, if that's what you have for me, I'm, I'm willing. And then the local church can help you sort out if that's God's will, if that's a call of God for your life. And we can readily say without hesitation today that the church of Christ today needs people to answer that call. The churches need to put forth that encouragement because we are running short on pastors and missionaries. And it's God's will that we seek out those who are called and then send them and support them to answer that call. And if God speaks to you about that, we would praise the Lord with you and follow through to help you determine if that's God's will for you to go to the mission field or to pursue uh, the pastorate. You know, it was mentioned in our state fellowship. There's like 180 churches, give or take a few. Over 30 of them right now are without pastors. And that's, that's a large percentage of the number of churches that exist of like faith in our state. And guess what? You can ask different pastors. You can ask the state rep, do you have any names for us? Guess what the answer is? No, don't have any. So there is a need. And we need to see churches presenting the word of God, the burning bush, and calling on people to be willing to say, here I am, if that's your will, Lord, for my life. But then also to take it, if it's not the pastorate or if it's not the mission field, it's still God's will for you to be contributing within the local church, uh, the fulfillment of the Great Commission, and to contribute to the body in some form based upon your gifts and your abilities that you have from God, and to constantly be thinking, Lord, here I am. Help me to keep doing what I'm doing, faithful to the Lord with the big picture in mind. Or is there more that I should be doing? Lord, here I am. Use me. So we want to 
look at the burning bush this morning, and I trust it's an encouragement and a challenge to you as the followers of Christ in the church today. And to see God, now the sovereign God in control of history, he had his plan for uh, the nation of Israel at that point with Moses. Nothing was going to stop the Messiah coming through uh, that nation. And Moses had a big part to play in it. That was God's will for him. Now we have the church today. Nothing's going to stop the building of the church. And every single believer, every single person of the member of the universal church has a part to play. Thank you, Lord, for that privilege and help us to be faithful in fulfilling the great commission based upon the grace and the power of God. Now, it's interesting, we'll see next with Moses, that he's been brought to a good point where he's willing to submit and uh, say, Lord, here I am. But he's also going to come up with some reasons not to. <laughs> he's going to say, what about this? What about that? But there again, he's there for an example for us. And it'll help us again to address our own lives and say, here I am, Lord. And we have concerns. No, I, I don't think it's you know, sinful to say, Lord, but I'm wondering about this. Or I'm not sure about that. But let God answer uh, those concerns. Let's close our time together in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you that as we go to the pages of scripture, we find men and women uh, just like us, men and women who are put there as examples to us to follow. And Lord, we thank you for the example of Moses and how you brought him to the point in his life where he was no longer trusting in himself, no longer trusting in his own wisdom, no longer seeking his um, own selfish purposes in life, but he was brought to a point of being willing to say, here I am. And Lord, I pray for every believer here today. We thank you for this local church body, for each one that is a part of it. We thank you for their faithfulness and their desire to serve you uh, in this local church as you build your church. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, challenge us to continue to be faithful to you. Or Lord, maybe you have a uh, will, a purpose for someone's life, life here today that you want more from them, that you have a plan and a purpose for them to contribute more uh, to the building of the church. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to them uh, through the word of God and that they would follow the example of Moses and find the joy that is found in serving Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just again thank you for all things in Jesus' name. Amen. close with one final thought before we pray. Uh, some of you had the opportunity to go to a fun funeral service yesterday, and uh, whenever you go to the a service of one of God's people, um, especially as you get older, you, you realize life is short. Um, I know young people think, oh, I got 40, 50 years, but uh, you, you talk to those older people, we'll tell you how quick it goes. <laughs> but you you're reminded at those moments that what's done for Christ is really all that mattered. You don't take anything with you. You just leave behind a testimony of one kind or another. And to be reminded of that in the light of what we've seen today and from the word of God, let me just attach that to you as well. Uh, serving Christ, uh, that's God's desire. Nothing more important than that. And so please consider 
uh, the word of God. Thank you for your service. Keep doing it uh, if you're where God wants you to be. But if there's something else the Lord wants from you as far as serving him, be open to it and respond as Moses did and say, here I am, because there's nothing more important than that in your life. And so let's close our time together in prayer. Father, again, we thank you for salvation. We thank you that you have saved us by your grace, that you have saved us to make us holy, to separate us to yourself, and you've given us the, uh, the joy of serving you. And Lord, we thank you for your servants here today, and I pray that you would continue to use them uh, to your glory, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.